You know, God doesn't make mistakes and God doesn't connect you with more than one person at a time when he calls that person your mentor. I think it's very important that we stay where we're planted. You know the old saying, dance with the one that brung you, go home with the one that brung you. Okay, then in this case, in these last days, people are running to and fro, looking to try to find answers. And a lot of times those answers are right in front of their face, but they don't see it. I think one thing we have to realize about Revelation, and I believe with all my heart that this is a prophetic year. And I don't say that because, you know, we don't need to be careful. There's a lot of false prophets, a lot of false sayings out there, a lot of teachers that are just very strange. And Jesus said, in the last days, you're going to hear a lot of that stuff. People prophesying what people want to hear. You read the scriptures, you'll discover that a lot of times Jesus, brother God spoke and said, I never sent this guy. He calls himself a prophet. I don't know who he is. Jesus talks about in the book of Revelation. There's, a, there's, a, there's women that have been raised up in the last days, not godly women, ungodly women, who call themselves prophetesses. You, you can't meet a prophet unless he's been through hell. That's what they do. They go through hell. That's the whole idea. If you remember the book of Job, James has a great statement concerning Job. Now, if you read the book of Job, most people zero in on Job's weaknesses, and that's found around the second chapter of verses 4 or 5, where he says the thing that he feared the most came upon him. All right, we understand that. But, you know, God doesn't remember Job as a failure. All of his flaky friends and everybody that tried to steer Job away from his God failed. And the greatest attribute that this man Job had is one that you yourself have to begin to attract and ask God to help you with. And that's the fact that Job endured. Now the word endurance means putting up with something until it either goes away or you conquer it. Satan doesn't go away easily. When he finds a weak point, it's like anybody, you'll see these boxes. They find somebody that's got a broken arm or a, something wrong with them, their shoulders busted or their eyes. That's what they hit for. They look for the weak point and they just hammer it until the pain is excruciating enough to cause the other, the other guy to quit or just hand in the towel. But in Job's case, listen to what James says. And James was the half-brother of Jesus. And that's important to me, and I'll tell you why. Speaking to you out of my spirit. James, the half-brother, didn't recognize who Jesus was as his own blood brother, not blood brother, but brother and family, until after the resurrection. So all of those years, during the time he was raised in the household with Jesus, and during Jesus' three and a half years of ministry, not very long, was it? Three and a half years. James still didn't come to the grasp of the point that my brother, same family, different father, was in fact the Messiah. And that helps me to recognize that a lot of the things that James wrote can relate to you and I in our carnal walks. Do you understand that? Because he was carnal for a long time, even up to the resurrection. And then he finally got to the, oh my God, Jesus was who he said he was. The Messiah. He was dead and rose again from the dead and ascended into the heavens to sit at the right hand of God the Father. But a lot of the things that James has to say are very practical wisdom. Years ago in Bible school, he used to call James a practical man of God. He was practical because he could relate to you and me. He knew what it was like to be carnal. He knew what it was like to make mistakes. He knew what it was like to ignore the reality of Jesus until almost too late. But he came to his senses, just like you and I are coming to our senses. The church is being turned back to its roots. And the ones that turn the church back to its roots, or the children to the father and the father to the children, is in Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6. In the last days, the spirit of Elijah will be released upon the earth that before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, it's not the first coming, is it? The first coming of Jesus was glorious. But the great and terrible day of the Lord is before he comes and judgment's released upon the earth. And he says, before the judgment is released upon the earth, he says, I will send forth the spirit of Elijah and he will come with a message lest I smite the earth with a curse. Now, I read that a, a week or two ago and God took me back to Deuteronomy. And he said, if you deny the Lord and turn your back on him and start worshiping the gods of this world, giving them more time than you honor to the God of your salvation, 
then all these curses shall come upon you. So no, God doesn't curse people. No, no. The curse is the result of disobedience. See? The wages of sin is still death. The wages of sin is death. Therefore, if I turn my heart back to God, He'll release blessing on me. But if the church has lost its zeal for the fathers, spiritual fathers, we've lost, generally speaking, we have lost the respect and honor due fathers. Natural fathers, but more importantly, spiritual fathers. You can't create something and ask God to bless it. That's, that's why he said, when you're going to bring me an offering, don't, don't, don't bring me something that you made with your hands or that you grew out of a field. You got to bring something with blood attached to it. See? That that blood shed blood is only possible with something God created. God created the animals to kill an animal to take its innocence to shed its innocent blood is something that God can receive because he created that life cycle. You can grow corn. Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. And God said if you had done what I told you to do, I would have received it. But now because you bring me something that you made, it's cursed. And unless you repent of it, then you're cursed too. Because Satan will take advantage of your natural efforts. Today we're in a time where people are saying they're natural. Psychological warfare waging against the church. Everybody now wants to give you shout classes, anger classes, psychological twist your head round classes. None of the things that you can do to change your soul have any power. Only Jesus Christ by the power of His Spirit can do that. And so the natural offerings God considers to be an anthema. Bring me something of spiritual value. Bring me your heart. Bring me your worship. Bring me your faith. See, the, the whole idea of giving, financial giving, spiritual giving, use, giving your time, these are all things which demonstrate faith. It's the faith that brings God into your scene and into your situation. The giving of something is just a demonstration of faith which God receives as a demonstration. That in itself doesn't bring the blessing. Job in himself made a lot of mistakes, but here's the one thing he did right. In, in, in James 5 verse 1, excuse me, 5, 5 verse 11, he says, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Now, that's a, that's a general comprehensive statement made by the half-brother of Jesus. We count them. Who's the we? Anybody that wants to seek a walk with God, we will see in them when a man or a woman endures hardship in the name of the Lord Jesus, we consider them a blessed people. What does that mean? It means the people that demonstrate a willingness to endure hardship in the name of the Lord draw honor to their God. Therefore, when we draw honor to our God by the things which we do not do, as well as the things that we do do, God blesses us. Do you see that? See, a righteous man is blessed not because of his own righteousness, because he draws attention to his God. Any great victory that was ever waged from, from David and Goliath on, Samson, all of them, they all found victory when they praised God. They all had some form of natural talent. David was just a young lad when he slaughtered Goliath. But he had some talents. He knew how to use a sling. See? So what I'm saying to you is God uses the things that you learn before you even understand the things of the Spirit. He uses the skills that you've learned even in the world to honor Him. But the difference is, instead of you saying, my sling will deliver me, you say, my God will deliver me. And then maybe God will use the sling to do it. So we count them happy which endure. That's what James says. When we see somebody that is enduring because of their faith in God, there is no endurance if you don't wait long enough to see the victory. If you quit too early, if you faint, before the time period is up for your waiting period. Why do we wait? I'll explain that to you in a second. This waiting period is very important for you, not for God. If God wanted to grant you a miracle on the spot, sometimes he'll do that. But most of the time, you better get used to waiting. Especially when you're new in the faith or you're backslid. Backslid people have to wait twice as long. Yeah. Why? 
because they've lost their initial contact with God. And so the Lord has to use extreme circumstances then to get you back to fall in love with God again. When it comes to the things of God, a lot of people will try to substitute a real walk for God. But it, the ones who make it through the hardship, like Job, like Job, their, their, their conquest is recorded in heaven. It's recorded here in James' writings. They're blessed to endure. He said, you've heard of the perseverance of Job. Perseverance. Endurance. He didn't quit. No matter what they did, no matter what the devil did, no matter how hard things got for him, he didn't turn his back and walk away. All his friends said, you should just repent and give up. My God, even his wife. Curse your God and die. God has forsaken you. That's what the devil tells us. You've done something really bad. God's given up on you. He's wasted too much time on you already. You flaky thing, you. And this has to happen in all five areas of your life. Spirit, soul, body, finance, relation. Each one of those five arenas of life, you will have to get the victory over the willingness to quit. The biggest battle you face is being obedient. The second biggest one is continuing in your obedience. Started off tithing and serving God and all that, praying, reading your Bible. And here you are five years later, barely even pull the Bible out anymore. And if you do, it's to try to teach somebody something that you yourself don't even know. See? And when those things happen, then difficulty finds its way back against you. And there's pushback. I told you last week, there's a lot of pushback happening right now. Now what happens to the person like Job who gets a lot of pushback? He has to be patient because him trying to resist in his own strength doesn't work. Satan said, you touch his flesh, he'll quit on you. He didn't. Take all his goods away, he'll quit on you. He didn't. Take away his piece of his mind and then he'll quit on you, but he didn't. And all of these things, it says that Job did not forsake the Lord. That's endurance. That's what most Christians don't have. It doesn't take a lot. How does Satan know how much it'll take? He'll keep pushing you until you quit. Well, what hope do I have? Jesus Christ. You know, if you read the book of Job, it says, have you considered my servant? Well, uh, yeah. Why? Because he runs from evil and he loves God. But Satan says, I have a few things that I know about Job. And if you, if you allow me, I'll prove to you that Job will forsake you just like all the others that have taken a hike. James says a little bit further on, he says, you heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end intended by the Lord. Now, Job didn't see it until the end came. If there's an opportunity for you and I to gain experience, it's only going to come through endurance. Job saw the end of the mystery when the end came. While he was going through it, it must have been horrific sitting in the fireplace scratching boils off of his skin with broken pieces of pottery. where everybody was against him, where he'd lost his children, all his wealth, everything that a man normally trusts in was taken from him. And God left him with a naggy wife because of covenant. Do you understand that? Yes. Anything that's not covenantly given to you by God can be removed by the devil. Are you even listening to what I'm saying today? You can't get this kind of a walk with God by listening to someone else talk about Him. I don't care how smart we think we are. These times in which we are living now will try every man's metal. Peter says, why do you think this is a weird thing that you're going through? And here, James says, look out the end of Job which was always intended by the Lord. Job didn't know it, neither will you. 
that the Lord is really compassionate and full of mercy. Then why am I going through this stuff? Go to Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified, how? By faith. Remember I told you it's not what you do. It's who you are. Nowhere in the Bible, children of God, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we are to bring forth fruit. We cannot produce fruit. The only way we can produce fruit is that fruit comes from who we are. Our efforts, our personal attempts to produce fruit are futile. If we are to create, produce fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold, we produce it because our faith increases and our walk with God increases. Your works are useless. People spend half their life on the missionary field and God never told them to go on the missionary field, but they think that's going to find me a place in heaven. No more than cleaning toilets if that's what you should have been doing. Are you listening to me? Yes. Your works are like filthy rags. Therefore, if we're not commanded to produce fruit, but we are commanded to bear fruit. Do you see the difference? Religion requires you to demonstrate certain acts which will make you righteous before God. And, and the whole premise is, is at fault. Because the only one that can make us righteous is your walk with Jesus Christ. And, and no matter how far you progress, there's always a, another level to which you can attain to by losing more of yourself. Amen. Something leaks out, the Holy Ghost takes over. And Jesus said, Satan in the last days, listen to me carefully, Satan in the last days has a bowl with Christians who have been taught that their manner of works is going to somehow prepare them for what's coming on the earth. Just showing up, and it's not. In these last days, God is looking for a people who operate totally and absolutely by faith. That the latter-day church is being trained up in all the wrong strengths. We are very proud of ourselves. Because after all, we're living in America and we have all this stuff going for us. But in fact, the final church is described by Jesus as wretched and miserable and poor. Locking Jesus on the outside, banging to come back in again. The power is in the lack of strength of ourselves. The more we trust in God, the more you allow God to show you your weaknesses, then the stronger you become because he will not fill a vessel that thinks it's already full. But the church should be a place where we are dependent upon our creator. And the teachers that are being raised up now are doing the exact opposite. Well, the church right now, my beloved, are going through a real shaking period because the end result of Job was mercy and tender, and tender grace and tender mercy. The end of the church in these days is going to be a church that has stood the test. Romans chapter 5. Let's look at that. Chapter 5, verse uh, 1, please. Therefore, having been justified by faith, Paul's saying the only way we can justify ourselves before God is faith. Now, most people don't know what faith is, except I'll, t I'll tell you one thing. As he goes on here, he explains a little bit more about faith, how it's connected to other things, and how our faith is continually sifted by God until it becomes something that's powerful. Something that can change environments, change atmospheres. That faith, when it comes together, can change a whole atmosphere. It can change a house, a suburb, a nation. And it all starts off with people demonstrating their faith in God. Think, so it says, we have peace because we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that grants the peace. Through whom also we have access by faith. How do we get access to Christ? By faith. Into this grace in which we make our stand. We make our stand because of our faith in Christ. Not what we do, but what he has done for us. And a stand, when we talk about a stand, we're talking about somebody who makes a positional challenge check of where they are in life and are unwilling to change their position or change their location or change their manner of thinking to suit other people. If I make a stand for something, God says, if you make a stand, I'll stand with you, but your stance has got to be on my word. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. 
It says in the book of Ephesians, having done all to stand, stand. There's an endurance factor to that. You can't just give up or change the way you feel about God because of your emotional upsets. If you're going through a hard time, seek out some brothers or sisters in Christ and pray with them, get some intercessory prayer going and punch through. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I know in my heart the Holy Spirit spoke to me very strongly about getting His people to make a stand and having done all, make that stand. When are we supposed to make the stand? When it's good? No, when it's bad. Having withstood in the evil day. You're in it. You're in it. This is it. Don't, don't think it's coming. It's already here. I mean, if you're going to destroy somebody, then you've got to make them think that they're in no danger. Right? It says that they fall the grace of and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3 and not only that, not only the good times, he says, and the grace of God and the mercy of God. And not only that, Paul says, but we also glory in tribulation. Yeah. Oh, really? Now, you have to have a mindset to be able to convert antagonism into victory. I mean, you get into a boxing ring, get knocked down a half a dozen times, you start to wonder whether you should be in the ring in the first place. But the question a lot of champions ask themselves is, why was he able to knock me down? What is it about my nature <clears throat> that keeps me going back doing the same thing and getting knocked down every single time I do it? Well, you shouldn't be a boxer and you're never going to be a champion. Because what champions do is they go home and they run pictures, they run the videos of the fight. They watch the strategies of your opponent. We are not ignorant concerning the strategies of Satan. Yeah? That's what Paul said. He said, I've taught you these things and you keep getting knocked down. But if you start to convert the thing which is de defeating you, if you start to convert that into a learning experience, perhaps then you'll get back into the ring and know what your adversary is going to do before he does it so that you'll be knocking him down instead of the other way around. Now, but Christians see in general, you really don't want to put that into motion. It's the work part that you have the problem with. We all do. We all want to sort of sit around and have someone do it for us. But faith doesn't just sit around waiting to jump on you. Faith wants to see you do something before it, it's attracted to you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But faith is what motivates people to do something. When you're motivated to do something and you actually do it, then that releases faith, which in turn draws God. There is no harvest without sowing the seed. Faith is just a result of something that you've sown. It's the reward for the work that you have done, not your intended work. If a farmer looks out at his field and never plants the seed, he's got no right to expect the harvest. Oh God, give me a harvest. Oh Lord, let the rain fall. Oh Lord, give me a multiple so I can pay back my debts. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing. That's like the Lord says, there's nothing to bless. You didn't do anything. Well, I'm praying. Yeah, but you didn't do what's necessary to see me move. I, I've got to have some seed in the ground, boy. Then I've got to get you out there and weed it, water it, take care of it. Then I'll bless it. I'll cause it to grow, but because of your faith in me and you've done the work, I can bless you because you're one of my children exponentially greater than the guy in the field next door to yours. But it only comes because you demonstrate that you have a belief in me that goes beyond simply praying about it. The end result of all prayer is action. Knowing, not only that, but we glory in tribulation. Why? You're going to answer it. I don't like tribulation. Well, who does? I gave you a definition of tribulation years ago. Tribulator was a piece of iron with little teeth on it and the old time farmers uh, you know, in the Midwest used to rake the corn over this tribulator and the teeth would tear the seed off of the corn husk and just leave the husk. Save you a lot of time. It was a big seller. Now I saw an article that was advertising them back in the, in the wild, wild west, you know, for the farmers to take out there and their wives would have this tribulator, you know, and they could make corn stuff a lot faster with this tribulator, either for fresh corn or dried corn. It would rip the seed off the husk 
leaving what was useless from that which was worthwhile. Tribulator, tribulation. So he says we glory in those being ripped over something with teeth that tears our flesh up. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Now why would tribulation produce perseverance? Because you've got to have the big picture and realize that not one sparrow fall, nothing happens in your life as a Christian, whether you are a heavy prayer or not. Nothing happens in your life without the knowledge of God. Why do some people move further in God than other people? Because of their actions and their choices. Most action is a result of a reaction. Faith is the reaction to a need once I put that need to work. Do you know the parable of the sower? The final part of the parable of the sower? The parable of the sower, the last one is the good heart. And if you read that in Luke, it says, And the finally the seed that was sown on the good ground, uh, he that received the word of God and with patience... Endure. You see that? So, yeah, the seed is good seed. Nothing wrong with the seed, but the heart is the problem. And he says the one who reaps the 30, 60, 100 fold are the ones not necessarily who just received the, the seed, but were willing to put up with some hardship while that seed took root. And even after that, before you can reap the harvest, you've got to do the work. The harvest isn't going to jump into your truck. See? Everything that you want in this world, God's already made provision for it. I believe that with all my heart. He wants us to be healthy, happy, wise, prospered, blessed, even as your soul prospered. 3 John verse 2. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe those things that you've asked for. God will grant you the desires of your heart. Because your heart now is good. It wants what God wants. God doesn't want you poor, broke, busted, or disgusted. He doesn't want you lonely. He doesn't want you depressed. See? But sometimes this de things like depression can grip a person's mind and their heart to the point where it's, it's exasperating. Yes. I've often asked God, why didn't I get a breakthrough earlier? It's in the hardship and the tribulation that you develop patience. Because if you really say, I believe God, then you'll be tested in your ability to withstand in the evil day. This is the biggest problem in the church. People don't want to wait. And I'll give you the answer, a short-term answer. You ready? If you want to be part of the remnant, you've got to learn, to be, learn how to wait and learn how to suffer. Because when the answer comes, nobody's going to bail you out. You'll know it was God. And the best part is, the best part is that He'll make provision for you while you're waiting. It may not be the desire of your heart yet, but He'll make sure that you're still breathing in and out and you still have food on the table and you still have a roof over your head and somebody to call you up and tell you that they love you. Yeah. See, this is the way it works. This is true Christianity. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, not only that we glory in our tribulations. The glory is a word they're used in somebody uh, is, in a, is in a competition and, and gets the prize. See, the glory is yours because you paid the price, you did the training, you ran the race race, and you won the race. Therefore, glory is attached. Now we give you a little plastic uh, uh, cup or something, right? But in the old days, the Romans, when they first did that, and even the Greeks, they only gave them a little wreath, but the adoration of the people, the people gave glory to the champion. They all stood up and they all you know, clapped hands and wonderful and they make statues of it, all this kind of stuff. So, so the glory was in the recognition of your victory. I think sometimes we would be better served if we understood what Paul was getting at, that we glory in our tribulation. Why? Why are you glorifying in your tribulation? Because I know my God is aware. I, I'm not just sitting here suffering in silence. I've prayed about it. I'm believing God for overcoming victory. I'm believing God for the breakthrough in my life. See? And I'm going to trust in God and I will not forsake Him just because of all this pushback against my life. In due season, you will reap if you don't faint. Now, now this principle has to be understood by the body of Christ. Because if you don't get that, it won't take much to push you over. You're going to have to be willing to take it in the chops. Now, 
Typical Christianity will always make it, oh, God will always bail you out. He doesn't always bail you out. But he will deliver you. <laughs> do, do you understand? Now, your testimony can stand up under any kind of cross-witnessing. You say, well, it's like the blind man. They went to Jesus, and Jesus said, he said, what do you want? He said, that I might see. You remember? And he spat and made mud and stuck it in the guy's sockets in his eyes. He was born blind. He said, and Jesus said, well, how's that, brother? And he said, I see men walking as trees. And Jesus did it again. Spat and he said, it. And after that, the Pharisees came and said, you, what are you doing? You're the blind man. He said, I'm not blind anymore. Yeah. Well, what happened? This man, Jesus, prayed for me. And they said to him, well, he shouldn't have. Because he's an evil man and full of demons. And the blind man said, well, all, all I can tell you is I was blind and now I see. <laughs> see, 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 there's the testimony. Yeah. And that testimony is what will defeat the devil. Take this from him. Take that from him. Take it. It doesn't really matter anymore. Because in the long run, we have seen the endurance and the long suffering and the grace of God toward Job. And how his endurance drew God's attention. Everything in the kingdom is birthed out of tribulation. Even your salvation. There could have been no salvation had there not been a crucifixion. What did Jesus say? To pick up your own cross and follow me. You're going to have to learn how to sacrifice yourself, which is your reasonable service. And then he says, not even coming to the door to greet me. Now I'm talking about the story, right? He says, I went to the door and banged on the door. He said, don't you know who I am? I'm a man of great honor and wealth and substance. God told him, don't, don't you go to the door for him. Just tell him what to do. And when he told him, he said, go down and dip in the, this filthy old river. He said, isn't there a clean river I can do? You know the story, right? Yeah. Then he adds injury to insult and says, I've got to do it seven times. <laughs> now, how many times have you been through some trials and difficulties and it gets to the fourth or the fifth time and you say, that's it, I'm done with this. God has forsaken me, the devil's a liar, and my past is no good. Now, how many times is it going to take? Peter said the same question. How many times have I got to forgive this jerk? Jesus said, not seven times, but 70 times. In other words, as long as it takes until you've let him go in your heart. You see? So it's all about the heart. The, the process is about redefining who you are. You better get used to waiting a little bit longer. Knowing tribulation produces perseverance. It will only produce perseverance if you understand the power that is released from being able to make a stand in the name of the Lord. Jesus said only one time to the person who's going through persecution, he says, blessed are they who are persecuted for my name's sake. The other people are losing everything. But he said, if you continue to make your stance because you are making a stance on me, the lands, the houses, all this other stuff will be added to you and eventually eternal life. See? The tribulation produces perseverance, the ability to withstand difficulty and trouble and trials. And perseverance then produces godly character. And character produces hope. In other words, you can't rob me of my belief that God is good because I've been through this before and I'll probably go through it again, but the end result is always the same. I win, devil loses. Yeah. Now, hope does not disappoint. Why not? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And what does that mean? It means that through all of this trial, tribulation hurts, through the character building processes that you're all going through, through the difficulties of life, then the, the character that was built, all of this leads me now that I have hope where other people give up. I still have hope. Yeah. 
And my faith is demonstrated in the hope that I have because I now know in my deepest heart that God loves me. The love of God poured out in the heart of men and women crying, Abba, Father. See, no good thing will he withhold from them that love him. Why do we love him? Because we've gone through the trials, the tribulations, the character building and the hope. Now I can call myself a Christian because I can associate myself with the trials and the tribulations of the life of the Messiah. The life that now I live, Paul says, I live through him who was crucified and rose again from the dead. The whole understanding of waiting and time is really important. Now before I go, remember last week we, we, we shared this scripture in Mark 5 where it talks about the woman with the issue of blood, remember? Now I, I hope you've read that because it's really, really important to get these, these parallels of how faith operates in the lives of men and women of God. It's always the same. When we read the story, she heard what Jesus was doing. She wanted what she had heard Jesus do for other people. Now that's where most Christians stop, right there. They want, but they won't do the next step. What is it? She began to witness and testify with her own mouth. She said, if I can just get, if I can just get to touch the hem of the master's garment. What happens then? Now remember, this woman said, I know. How would she know if she'd never been prayed for? Huh? How do you know God's going to do something supernatural to shift your circumstances and bring you into right standing with God? The answer is in what you have been through. Now listen, you'll learn something. This woman had no walk with God to begin with. But it said that she had internal hemorrhaging that wouldn't quit and it was killing her. She said something very profound. She said that I, that, well, it says in the story, that she had been to all the doctors, all the psychiatrists. She had spent everything she had on physicians. And not even growing any better, she grew worse. She had been through hell and back again. She got to the point where there was no alternative in her life and then God turned on the light bulb she heard about the Messiah see I really believe that Christians have had horrendous lives before they ever gave their heart to Christ and that suffering that they went through set them up for a divine intervention how do I know that because God loves people I have in mind, oh, I didn't get to the finish button. She said, then she did, and then she received. These, these four steps, or actually five, heard, wanted, said, did, and received. These are how the kingdom of God works in every area of your life. Now, this is a prophetic generation. Then we're going to have to understand that everything that's going to have a focus focal point back toward the prophets and the ministry of the prophets to the last day's church the Bible says in Luke 21 verse 19 in your patience you will possess your souls now if you understand that the soul has nothing to do with the spirit your mind your will your imagination memories all those kinds they're soulish sense ruled factors but they have nothing to do with faith at all. They're given to you so that you can conduct yourself with some form of interaction in the body of Christ in the world system. But if our lack of endurance is due to a soulish weakness, if God right now is putting you through situations or allowing you, I should say, to put you through circumstances and situations that are trying your patience and your willingness to trust God in bad circumstances and bad situations, it's because he wants to weaken your soul and strengthen your spirit. In your patience, you will possess your soul. Amen. 